Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today because life is nothing if not a series of opportunities to do an abrupt about face when best laid plans fail. Hi, my name is Summer. Welcome back to my channel. Now, I originally intended this video to be a full review of the 1993 Super Mario Bros. movie, and in some ways, it will still be that. And in other ways, it's going to be a bunch of other stuff as well. Now, a little context, a little backstory for why I had to make that change. First, we have to discuss my motivation. I have always wanted to post more regularly on YouTube ever since I started my channel in 2010, but mm, I never really had a drive behind it other than like, wouldn't that be cool? But now, as of this year, I have discovered the secret sauce. I have a secret nefarious reason for why I'm suddenly posting more. And do you know what that is? I'll let you in on my secret. My nefarious little secret. Marketing. That's right, everybody. I'm marketing something, and that something is my book. I'm writing a gothic novel. It is the tale of a young woman on the cusp of her society debut who is suddenly orphaned through tragic circumstances and must go to live with her godfather in his mysterious house full of secrets, regrets, and hidden horrors. It's very good, or at least it's getting there, and I'm super excited about it. And once I finish this draft, I do plan on sending it out to some traditional publishers to see if there is anybody who wants to traditionally publish this, but if they decide against it, that's okay. I've already settled in my heart that if nobody wants to publish it for me, then I am just going to publish it myself, because what I find most important is I just want it to be read by people. And so I'm really excited, and Having a social media following in that sense would be very helpful in either way. Traditional publishing looks at it favorably, and if I'm marketing it myself, I want to know I have an audience to market it to. So I was like, self, yes, I love YouTube. I've wanted to post stuff regularly for a while, talk about movies, books, stories, video games, etc. So why not go ahead and do that thing I've always wanted to do anyway, but now, it's for the book. Like it, it is all in service of the book. So I have like a reason and a purpose to do it other than just like, well, that'd be cool if I had time for it. Now I'm making time for it because it's for the book. I'm very passionate about this book, okay? And in doing so, hopefully build an audience for something that is important to me. So all that to say, if you like videos about movies, books, storytelling, video games, or you think my book sounds cool and you're like, you know what, sign me up for whenever that's ready because I'm always down for a gothic novel, then go ahead and kiss the subscribe button gently right there on its little forehead and say, good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Hamlet. Ooh, that was a weak clap. Now, what does any of this have to do with Super Mario Bros? I hear you asking. Summer, I thought we were talking about the Brothers Mario. Not quite yet. First, we're still talking about me and how I work in social media and marketing. And so like everybody who does anything on the internet, I understand the importance of following trends and SEO. And so while I was crafting my grand scheme to secretly market my book to you, <laughs> you guys never even knew that's what I was doing. Um, I decided I was going to do one movie review a quarter. So I looked at the list of 2023 theatrical releases and I found the movies, one, that I was most interested in seeing in theaters, and two, had a sequel, an original movie, a um, something with a similar actor or a similar genre that I could review and upload about a week before the new movie came out in order to ride that wave of SEO. The best example of this is the movie review I just released. It was a deep dive into the original Scream and I released it a few days before Scream 6 came out. And thankfully it actually did way better because I, I capitalized on the SEO. So it was like, yay, who would have guessed that actually doing something that people are talking about at the time they're talking about it would work. <laughs> now Q3, I've got figured out. 
Obviously, the biggest release is going to be the Barbie movie. And obviously, I'm going to review Barbie the Princess and the Popper. And obviously, we are all going to have a spectacular time when that happens, okay? But it was Q2 that I was a little wobbly on because Q2 was the only quarter that I had two movies in mind, both of which came out on the same date in April. One was the new animated Super Mario Bros. movie, and the other was Renfield. So these were my two plans. Plan one, Super Mario Bros. I was going to review the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie. Plan two, in honor of Renfield, I was going to review the Nicolas Cage cult classic, Vampire's Kiss. Then I would release either one that I settled on on April 7th, precisely one week before opening night, because opening night for both of them was April 14th. I did an Instagram poll to see what the people would want. And while the majority of the vote said they wanted the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie as the YouTube video, more people were interested in Renfield as the newer movie. And therein, our problem lies. Because tell me why. After all my careful consideration and planning, did I suddenly see with my own two eyes Super Mario Bros was no longer coming out on April 14th, but rather coming out on Wednesday, April 5th. It is my theory, it is my belief that in an effort to not have to, you know, battle something like Renfield or maybe another movie in, in theaters, in the box office, basically the movie studio was like, bump that up. Bump that up to a Wednesday, nine days earlier than it was supposed to come out, and two days before I was going to schedule my video to go up? Have they no consideration for my plans? For my schedule? Also, there's the possibility that I just read the date wrong back in December and then confused myself with all my waffling between videos. Both are valid options. Anyway, my plan is ruined. I had to course correct, and in course correcting, I realized a Third thing, Phantom of the Opera's final show is on April 16th. April 14th, April 16th, that's very close. So as you can see, a lot of really big things are happening in terms of stuff I'm interested in, trends, and search engine optimization. So I said, you know what? It's a three for one. We're just gonna do all three things. Uh huh. My plans are shot for a simple one subject video, so we're just gonna do all of them. Which is <laughs> when faced with a choice, white shoes, right? So I'm gonna do a little mini review on the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie, and then I'm gonna do a little mini review on Vampire's Kiss, and then I am gonna break ground on what will almost certainly be a multi level deep dive into Phantom of the Opera. But don't worry, my pretty little baby. Don't you worry, my pretty little darling, my little dove, my little angel baby. It's just gonna be the first few shovelfuls. I know you got it in you, okay? <laughs> okay, we'll get there when we get there. All right, I promise it's not gonna be more than like five minutes of content. It's five minutes of your time. If you're having fun now, you'll have fun then. You're already locked in if you're this deep into this. I don't know, it's not perfect, okay? I realize that. But I literally spent 36 hours or more on my last movie review, 13 of which were one unbroken stretch in which I watched the sun set and then watched the sun rise and then still had like six something hours or more to edit after that. That was only a month ago and I just don't have it inside of me to do that again. Okay, so I'm just doing what I can with the movie release date pushed up and with balancing like work and personal projects and sleep. I'm just one woman. So I think we should just look at this as a fun little tasting menu on a variety of topics that have nothing to do with each other. And we're gonna have a nice time. Okay? Stop winking. I can't. All right. Oh, and uh, also a uh, small footnote. While writing this script, I decided to break this tasting menu down by meal, much as they do in the movie, The Menu but I will not be talking about the menu, okay? But Nicholas Holt is in the menu and he is also in Renfield. And Renfield is the reason I'm talking about Vampire's Kiss. So it's all connected. It all ties together. It is a spoof. It is an homage. And with that, we resume. Riverdale wants 
what Super Mario Bros. 1993 has. This movie is decades ahead of the dark and gritty curve we saw from DC. We live in a society where people say, what if Winnie the Pooh was a murderer? A society. And I think we have Super Mario Bros. 1993 to thank for that. I will not be backing up this accusation with any sort of factual evidence at this time. It is merely a feeling I have in my heart. But I will eventually do a full movie review on Super Mario Bros. 1993 because I have not one, but two copies of this DVD, which means it will eventually fall prey to my desire to review every single movie I own. Now, why do I have two copies, you may ask? Well, unbeknownst to me at the beginning of this, Super Mario Bros. was removed from every single streaming platform as of December 2022, so I couldn't find anywhere to rent this. So I went on Amazon and I found it for $3.94. Coincidentally, just about what it would have cost to rent it for 48 hours is how much it would cost to own it. So I said, be mine, be my Valentine. And they sent it to me. And they said, this is going to be here on March 26th. And I said, perfect. Then on March 25th, they said, just kidding. It's going to be there on the 27th of, or the 28th. Don't worry about it. And I said, oof, okay, that's fine. Then on the 27th or the 28th, they said, mm, listen, if it's not here by the 28th, we're sorry, you can get a refund. So at 9 p.m. on the 28th, when I opened my door and it was not there, I purchased a second copy because I figured it was a lost cause. Only to wake up, open my door on March 29th and see that some sort of midnight Amazon delivery man had dropped it off in the dead of night. So now I have two. Now I have two copies, but I've decided that this second unopened version, I'm going to do a giveaway when I hit a thousand subscribers and one of you lucky winners, you're just winners by subscribing, will get to keep this. But anyway, this movie is a dark gritty reimagining of the Super Mario Bros. games that plays, oh, so very fast and loose with concepts from the actual games. Just consider the Goombas. Consider, if you will, the Goombas. <laughs> Goomba! Yeah. And what we are left with is a final product that is just a bonkers film experience that both surprises and delights. Oh, there's something in my eye. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Things in my eyes. Things in my eyes. Okay. We opened 60 million years ago with a bunch of 8-bit dinosaurs and the meteor that destroyed them. Goodbye, dinosaurs! And therein lies the concept of this film. In this movie, there are two universes brought about when the strength of the blast of the meteor hitting the planet was so strong, it fractured into two parallel worlds. In one world, humans evolved from primates, and in the other world, humans evolved from dinosaurs. These two worlds, worlds collide, collide deep within the bowels of the Manhattan sewer and or subway system. Our story then shoots forward 60 million years. No more 8-bit. It's now raining in Manhattan, and a woman carrying a wrapped bundle deposits her precious cargo on the steps of a church before she runs back down to the sewer and or subway system and is ultimately captured. Where's the rock? Koopa. But what is it that she deposited on the steps of this church? A giant egg. Then we jump forward another 20 years. And that's when we meet our main cast of characters. We have the brothers Mario, two plumbers, one hardworking, down-to-earth Mario, the other a dreamer, Luigi. And we also meet Daisy, an archaeological student who happens to wear the same crystal necklace that was left with the giant egg. Coincidentally, she also happens to look exactly like the lady who left the egg on the church. What could it mean? Who could possibly say? Not me. Not us. None of us. Since this is just a simple tasting menu, I can only give you the highlights. But let's start here. Manhattan and dino -hatton exist side by side. But dino -hatton is a few miserable streets and 
endless desert that has fallen under the corrupt corporate rule of the wicked King Koopa, a man who usurped the throne from the rightful leader until Koopa turned him into all this fungus and wants nothing more than to merge the two worlds together and to pillage the human world for resources. Got no resources in a great big stupa. To do so, he must find the crystal, which is actually the last shard of the meteorite that split our two worlds apart. And once he has that shard, only one of royal blood, like the missing princess, could withstand the force necessary to merge our two worlds together. The missing princess? None other than our very own Daisy. Daisy? This is getting weird. The archaeological student who has caught the eye of young Luigi. Do you eat? Yeah. Dinner? Sure. Once Daisy's kidnapped by King Koopa's nefarious forces, the brothers Mario have to follow her through the portal and must use all of their wits, smarts, and plumbing skills to save the princess and save the world. <laughs> Would I say it accurately represents the Super Mario Bros. games? No, not even a little bit. Not, not even a small amount. First off, there's no Princess Peach. Second, for the majority of this movie, Luigi is in red. Luigi is in red and Mario is in green. Also, the Mushroom Kingdom concept is there, but it's only there because King Koopa de-evolved the actual king into this fungus cluster that's all gooey and drippy and really distressing to look at. And this devolved drippy mus mushroom clusters revenge is to like grow across the entire city. So you've just got these weird drapey mushroom things all over Dino Hatton. And it's just unpleasant to look at. All right, now some high points. Harry Potter's Aunt Petunia is there. You have your mother's eyes as King Koopa's love interest and every single costume she wears knocks it out of the park. Incredible. Next, the guy playing Bowser, uh, he's never called Bowser, but he's obviously Bowser. He says he's descended from a T-Rex and I noticed he just kind of walks around the entire movie like this. Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Lizard King. I will say they do eventually put Mario and Luigi in the right colors at the end. And some final things I really liked about it, uh, the dino song in the club. <laughs> Yoshi, probably the highlight of the film for me. <laughs> Toad's hair hat, so interesting, so iconic, so unforgettable. Ah, you know the law, Toad. <laughs> Overall, this movie is just so much fun, such a delight, just so weird and offbeat and nothing like the games. But, but I just, I, it was good. It was a good fun thing. And remember, one day I will be doing a giveaway. And since this isn't available on streaming anymore, maybe you could get this for free, but only if you subscribe. Soon, okay? Soon, okay? I'm almost done. I don't have too much more, all right? I don't have too much more. I really don't. Do you remember this meme? Oh, do you think I am? It is from our next course, Vampire's Kiss. Now I've only seen this movie once on Galentine's Day 2022, so what I'm about to say is very light, foamy, not as informed as what I was able to say during the Super Mario Brothers course. It is like an espuma. And what is espuma, you might ask? <laughs> and am I spelling it correctly? Or saying it correctly? I don't know. Espuma is the light and airy foam that you will sometimes see in fancy restaurants that is edible molecular gastronomy. Once I won an all expenses trip paid to a resort in Cancun from Ellen DeGeneres. You're getting a six day, five night stay at the Grand at Moon Palace in Cancun, Mexico. <laughs> 
in that resort, there was a French restaurant. And in that French restaurant, there was what claimed to be cheesecake. I ordered it. It wasn't cheesecake. It was a small log of what seemed to be cheesecake filling with little dollops of raspberry foam around it. And the foam, it was fine. The foam was fine, people. But much like Anya Taylor-Joy's character in the menu, fine dining is wasted on me. And I will take graham cracker crust over raspberry foam any day. I will take that any day. All this to say, the following recap of Vampire's Kiss is everything I can remember off the top of my head about this movie after watching it once a year and change ago. Galentine's Day 2022. There keeps being something in my eye. It's in there. Oh, oh gosh, it's just, it's in my eye. Okay, I'm just gonna move on. Nicholas Cage plays a man whose name I forget, but he's a high rolling businessman type, probably a lot like the guy from American Psycho, I assume, but I haven't seen American Psycho. I've only seen the Margot Robbie Vanity Fair parody video and a couple of clips from TikTok trends and the Google search results from when I looked up Feed Me a Stray Cat because someone had written that on the walls of the bathroom stall in the women's restroom on the second floor of Guggenheim Hall at the University of Northern Colorado. Actually, you know what? Quick request. If anybody sees this and you're currently going to UNC, not that one, the Colorado one, if you're currently going to the University of Northern Colorado and you are an art student and you are watching this and you have a class in Guggenheim Hall, can you go to that second floor restroom? And it's the, I think there are three stalls. There's the first stall, the second stall, and like the big stall. It's the middle stall. It's either the one closest to the door or if it's only two, or it's the middle stall if there are three. And on the right-hand wall, it should be there by the toilet paper. To the best of my memory, it was there all four years I was a student. And I just want to know if they ever fixed it or if it's still there. Thank you. Anyway, Nicolas Cage plays a high-rolling businessman who, while trying to get amorous with a lady, gets bitten by a bat who had flown into his apartment. And he is convinced that it is actually the bat form of a beautiful and mysterious woman that he had seen earlier in the evening and becomes convinced that he is transforming into one of the living dead, a creature of the night. You can see now why I had this as an option to review with Nicolas Cage playing Dracula in Renfield, yes? All the while, his poor assistant, a lovely girl with a giant cross necklace, bears more and more of his wrath. Am I getting through to you? As she cannot seem to locate a single sheet of paper needed for a big case. Alba, I told you that I already checked those files. I already checked them. Throughout the film, Nicholas, or whatever his name is, script writing me is refusing to look it up. That's right. I am refusing to look it up. I am nothing if not dedicated to artistic integrity. Insert clip of me typing. Nick Cage's character is going to therapy for, you know, high role in business reasons. How could somebody misfile something? But it's not working. Hey, Q-R-S-T-U-V, do you X, Y, Z? And the reason why is a toss up. It's either because Nick Cage's character isn't telling anybody he's worried he's turning into a vampire or the therapist just isn't very good at her job. Anyway, he keeps seeing his beautiful vampire lady all around town, or at least he thinks he does, while his life begins to fall apart, as do all of his relationships. He starts fearing the sun. The sun. Pretty sure at one point he bites the head off a pigeon while wearing plastic vampire teeth. I wonder if I could make my next appointment with you sooner. He destroys his own apartment and starts sleeping under his flipped over couch as if it is a coffin. What is happening to me? He's not doing good. He's not thriving. He becomes increasingly obsessed with the paper his assistant can't find. I couldn't think of a more horrible job if I wanted to. 
And when she does eventually find it, he's so mad it took her so long and that it had been misfiled that he chases her screaming through the building. It's too late, Alma! It's all too late, Alma! Very nearly assaulting her, only stopping when her torn neckline reveals her giant cross necklace. It might have just been a normal sized cross necklace. I don't know. He reacts as if it's a giant cross necklace and <laughs> runs away in fear. And then, okay, it was either after this attack or at some point before when he'd just been really, really rude to her, she decided to stay home. And then he shows up at her house during the business day and is like, can you please come back? And she's like, I don't know. I just, you're being very rude. He's like, I won't be rude. Can you please come back? Can you come to work? And she's like, mm, okay. Then they get into a taxi. And I just remember it being this really, really long, awkward, uncomfortable taxi ride that he eventually like stops the car so he can get out and throw up probably whatever parts of the pigeon he managed to consume and I just it just I remember it just being long and weird and uncomfortable and that is part of the movie it's horrible when there are tensions between employer and employee Alva. finally Maria's brother and I think her name is Maria honestly I cannot remember Alva 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 I wonder what Alva's doing today. He sees that she's all bruised from the attack and he's like, time to go beat somebody up. So he goes to Nicolas Cage's character's apartment, busts down the door. The apartment's already in shambles. And so he has to go on the hunt to try and beat him up, I think. And honestly, I'm trying to remember, but like I said, I only saw this once, Valentine's Day of 2022, but I think this hunt with Alva. his brother is meant to have him be like the Van Helsing character. I might just be merging the classic Dracula story with Vampire's Kiss mistakenly, but I'm pretty sure that's what the point is. Like he is on a righteous quest to go slay Dracula. And so, it's, you know, that's the dynamic. I don't think he ever does slay him. I think he might just beat him up. I can't remember if his character ever gets staked. Maybe he does, maybe. That's for somebody else to answer, not me. Oh my gosh. It's just like, you can see that my eye is red, right? It's really bumming me out, man. I just wanna finish this, man, and it's just, oh. We make it to the end of the film and a battered, broken, and now absolutely bananas Nick Cage's character goes to the club. He sees a girl. He puts his vampire teeth in. He seduces her into a back room. Somehow manages to drink her blood while wearing the plastic teeth. And that just feels impossible for many reasons. But after he finishes this dark deed and thinks that he's completed his vampire transformation, he goes out on the dance floor. And who does he see? His beautiful, mysterious vampire lady. But it's not her. She's just normal. She's just a normal woman. With a normal life who doesn't know who he is. Peter, right? He's crazy. This has all been in his mind. Well, how are you? How am I? But then there's a glimmer. She made me one too! Does she remember him? No, she doesn't. Does she? No, she doesn't. Does she? No, she doesn't. Does she? Who can say? Not Nick Cage, because he is absolutely gone past the edge. He is, he's, he's gone. He is no longer with us. Nick Cage's character is gone. Better get back in your coffin, buddy. The sun's almost up. Anyway, he flees the scene, blood all down his three-piece business suit, cornering strangers while carrying a giant piece of wood and begging them to stake him. I'm a vampire. Kill me. While the police investigate the crime he just committed. In his mind though, he and his makeshift stake are in the psychiatrist office and he is well coiffed, clean, put together. Well, I've been thinking about my depressions very seriously. We see him acting this out, both like disheveled and bloody on the streets of New York City and put together and poised in the secured psychiatrist in the psychiatrist office. And he finally is just like, really all I want is love. Love? Yes, baby, real love. And the psychiatrist is like, oh, tee hee. I don't usually do this, but my next client is perfect for you. You have to meet. They meet, they kiss, and he lives happily ever after. Except he absolutely doesn't because he's still wandering the city streets 
probably just waiting to get picked up by the cops. We don't know. We don't see that. But definitely that's where he's ending. This movie is definitely one of those like cult classics that's so much fun to watch with friends. It's one of those like so bad it's good movies. And I I mean, it's it's fun. But at the same time, it strikes a nice balance where while you're almost certain uh, that it's just the portrayal of somebody having like a complete mental breakdown, there's also a lingering question like maybe she really is a vampire. Maybe he really did get bitten. So it's kind of like an unreliable narrator and that question isn't really answered. So which I think is a fun ending. And if it was real, if he really did become a vampire, I like to think it's that vampire who is going on to star in Renfield. It's not. The vampire in Renfield is supposed to be the classic Dracula. But if nothing else, I personally consider Renfield to be a spiritual sequel to Vampire's Kiss. Okay, on to the final course of the tasting menu, dessert. I was gonna do a like Phantom of the Opera iceberg where you kind of go through the iceberg and like talk about the subjects and see like how deep your knowledge goes. And my plan for this was that I was gonna, you know, do a little timer and do as many of the like top of the iceberg, easy, obvious ones as I could get done in five minutes. But I, I was looking and there's only like two icebergs and they're really sparse for Phantom of the Opera, which is surprising because all my time on the internet, I've been a fan of Phantom and I've stumbled across people who are just so much more of a fan than I could ever hope to be. So the fact that none of them have made a more intricate iceberg is interesting to me. So maybe my next video, I'll just make an iceberg. Or maybe I'll do a deep dive on something I've been wanting to learn more about for a while now. Yes. Yes. The hidden plot. I am going to pull up, I'm going to set a timer for five minutes and I'm going to pull up one of these icebergs and we'll see how much I can tell you guys about Phantom in five minutes. Like I said, it's just five minutes. It's just five minutes. All right, so ready and go. I also haven't really seen, oh, let me cancel. I also haven't really seen many of these iceberg videos outside of like one Five Nights at Freddy's deep dive. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna do the actual breakdown right, but Let's go ahead and start. So the first level, it says this is a work in progress, so maybe it'll get it'll get more thorough. But on this first layer of the iceberg, which isn't even the iceberg, it's just in the sky. It's so obvious. The first person you see is who is known as Jarek. Basically, it is Gerard Butler's Eric, Phantom of the Opera, from the 2004 Andrew Lloyd Webber film adaptation of the movie. And the first thing is Leroux's novel. Now, Leroux's novel is the original Phantom of the Opera story. It was written in 1910. It was originally released as a serial in a newspaper. It says in the copy that I have that when he finally finished the book, he went onto his porch and shot his pistol into the air and his children all cheered because that's what he did whenever he finished. But it was a gothic novel that kind of turned some of the tropes on their head because whereas in many gothic novels um the character of christine would have been the damsel in distress who is rescued by the handsome raoul raoul gets captured at the end and it is actually christine's kindness to the phantom that saves the day that makes him realize that he is a man and not a monster and he finds his humanity and lets her go so it was kind of like a unique twist on the traditional staples of the gothic genre. So that is that story. It's my favorite. I love the book version best. And then we move on to the next most obvious thing, the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, which premiered, oh, I think it was like 1985 on in London's West End and then quickly moved to Broadway. He wrote the part of Christine with his wife at the time, Sarah Brightman in mind. She was the first Christine. Her hair was naturally very curly and it was brown, which is different than book Christine who's blonde, but all of the Christines since wear a brown curly wig, except for one girl in 
oh, I wish I could remember her name, but I saw some pictures of her on Broadway. She went blonde and it was always interesting to see because usually Meg is blonde. Meg's character is also amped up from what it is in the book. She becomes like Christine's confidant in the musical, but the musical is a more or less... It is a somewhat faithful adaptation to the themes, even if it changes around some of the th the things that happen. Like big plot points, um, Joseph Bouquet dying happens within like two pages of the Leroux novel starting. But the musical has that as a high point, um, you know, like one of the bigger issues that happens in the middle of the story. Anyway, um, the Andrew Lloyd Webber, it's a classic. Sadly, it is by the time uh, this movie is... Anyway, this one's going to close on... Ah, I can't talk. It's going to close on the 16th. By the time I get to the rest of this iceberg, it's going to be closed. And that's so sad to me, but I did finally get to see it on Broadway for my 29th birthday. And then I saw it in London in September. And in London was the most incredible version I've seen of it. It was so good. Next, we have the movie adaptation, which came out in 2004. And it is fantastic. If I'm wrong, it was 2005. It was 2004. Who am I talking about? Anyway, the 2004 version was the version that finally made me fall in love with Phantom of the Opera. Before that, the only exposure I had to Phantom was this lady at a talent show. She did this thing where like half of her face was like made up like a girl and she had her hair all curled and half of her face was like slicked back and she had a mask. And then like it was a suit and it was a dress and she like lip sang Phantom of the Opera and little tiny baby eight-year-old Summer was entranced and was like, oh gosh, I wish this was a full story because this is incredible. 11-year-old um, Summer, when she saw the poster for the Phantom of the Opera movie, <laughs> mind blown. So my mom went and saw it first and she like, while we were driving once, she told me the whole synopsis and I was just enthralled. When it came out on DVD, I rented it. I watched it three times times before it got returned and I just have loved it ever since. So the movie adaptation, despite the fact that none of the singers are really like opera singers or like really super strong trained Broadway singers, a lot of people who don't like the movie adaptation don't like it because like Emmy Rossum is a very like delicate soprano. She's not actually an operatic soprano. Um, but it is what it is. I love it. Now, other books... I couldn't tell you all of them, but I can tell you some. There's definitely the Susan K. Phantom, which is sort of like the Phantom's origin story, um, his backstory. Oh, I only have 19 seconds. Uh, that's his origin story. I haven't read it. There's Phantom of Manhattan, which is a sequel. It's terrible. There is The Phantom's Apprentice, a recent adaptation, which is a retelling. I really like that. There's Angel of the Opera, which is Sherlock Holmes and the Phantom. I love it. There's The Canary Singer, which is, or the Canary Trainer, which is Phantom of the Opera and Sherlock Holmes, and it's garbage. Um, there are more, but those are all the ones I've seen. So, okay, that was fun. There was a lot to say about that. I guess I will hold off on this, or maybe do the other one. Haven't decided. But there we have the, that's the dessert. That is the Phantom of the Opera portion. And we, we move on. Alrighty, everybody, that is it. That is all from me. Thank you for joining me on this exquisite little tasting menu. If you liked eating at my dining establishment, if you liked my food, then I ask that you leave me a little comment, a little review, a little Yelp review, and tell all your friends that they should come and eat at my dining establishment. Unless, of course, they're the kind of people who like chicken fingers and fries, then they're not allowed to eat at my dining establishment. <laughs> Except in the moments when I really realized that somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way to fame and renown, I lost who I was. I lost the joy I found in, co in, in cooking. And it's only something as simple as, as a request for chicken fingers and fries or, or a cheeseburger. A simple cheeseburger and crinkle cut fries that could truly ignite that joy again. 
It's a real rosebud moment, not to reference Citizen Kane, but a rosebud moment, not to try and interpret what the ending of Citizen Kane means, but a rosebud moment. My name is Rafe Fines. You can call me Yes Chef. Thank you for watching the menu. So stupid. <laughs>